Hello, how are you? I need to make an extra video this week because of the resurrection of Jesus coming up here soon. Hope you're not celebrating Easter, even though this year it kind of falls on those days, the resurrection of Jesus, and uh, which is kind of interesting this year. But anyways, I want to do a video. I did two videos about, first one about the Feast of the Lord, kind of an introduction to Passover. Then I did my last video about Passover and how we should celebrate Passover. So if you want to know how to celebrate Passover, please go to that video. And then I also watched a really good one uh, by an interview by Zev Porat. He calls himself Messianic Rabbi, but really he doesn't like the word messianic because that word is being used by too many people like Hebrew roots people that think they need to go back to the Hebrew roots. We need to understand our Hebrew roots, but it doesn't mean we have to go back. Why? Because Jesus started a new covenant. The old covenant is gone. Okay? It's gone. Uh, the the Jews destroyed that covenant. They broke the covenant. And that's why in Jeremiah 31, 31, Jesus, or God said, Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah that Jesus will start, the Messiah will start a new covenant. Or Zev said, refresh the old covenant. I don't think it's a refreshing because it's really new. It's new. Actually, maybe it's not new. It's actually the original covenant. If we're going by uh, the original high priest, which Jesus traces himself back to, the order of Melchizedek, right? We find that in Hebrews. Then, yes, he goes back to the original covenant. The covenant, actually, before the temporary covenant of the covenant with the Jews on Mount Sinai. He didn't say that, but that's the that's the case. But this Seb Porat really did a great job um, explaining a lot about Passover and, in a sense, how we should celebrate it and didn't deviate from what I already said in my last video. Seb Porat is from Israel. He is a he calls himself rabbi because he's from a rabbi school, or not a rabbi school, rabbi family. I think his grandfather and father was a rabbi. And of course, he is also a believer in Jesus Christ. And I watch him sometimes. Okay, not always, but sometimes. Because, anyways, I'm not going there. <laughs> but I do. And what he said about Passover was really good, so I wanted to bring that in my video. But I really want to talk more about the resurrection because my last video was about Passover. Okay? And so, well, the resurrection is coming up. I didn't say too much about the resurrection and how we really should celebrate. Well, actually, I did bring it in. Because see the way the early church actually celebrate Passover or hmm, what Jesus instructed them to celebrate was actually celebrated on the first day of the week as often as they could. And in the beginning, they did celebrate it every week. They came together on the first day of the week to celebrate what they, what we today call the Last Supper. But see, that is the Passover um, uh, tradition that we should continue because Jesus gave it to us. Again, watch my last video and you will know. Now, this Seth said something really interesting, of course, about this um, the event that happened that Jesus fulfilled 
2,000 years ago. Okay, almost 2,000 years ago. And he was saying something very interesting. He was saying that really this Last Supper really was celebrated or not, was they, they had the Last Supper that I was talking about in my last video, really on a Tuesday. Why? Because on the next day, Jesus was killed. He was the true Passover lamb. And the Passover lamb was killed the day before Passover or that day when Passover started. Passover starts on sundown. So the day, daytime before at four o'clock, Jesus was killed as the true Passover lamb. And then sundown is when Passover started. That's what he says. So therefore, Jesus was, if he was killed on that um, Wednesday, okay, because that was the day before Passover, then the disciples and Jesus had the Last Supper the, the, the evening before that. That would have been the evening of Tuesday. So I think that was very important because we always thinking about, oh my goodness, how the Catholic Church messed up these days. So terribly bad. Okay, so terribly bad. So the Last Supper is actually what is today, Tuesday. So Tuesday at sundown in Jerusalem is actually right now. Right now it's three o'clock. It's been, it's right now, let me see, 11 o'clock probably there at night. So this is about the time when really Jesus had the Last Supper and was sitting together with Jesus. And they went to, where did they go? The, the um, Mount Olive, okay, where they, uh, Jesus prayed. And the, the, and the disciples went to sleep. Remember that? And then Judas came and, uh, um, you know, they came with the soldiers and Judas gave him the kiss. This is what's happening on, that happened on the Tuesday. And I know today is Tuesday. Does anybody think about that? Does anybody think about that? And I'm making this video on Tuesday. Okay. I think that's very, very interesting. So then on Wednesday, he died. Okay. So it took him all over the place. In the morning, remember, uh, Peter was denying him. That was in the morning. And then by four o'clock in the afternoon, they had him on the cross. So that's tomorrow on Wednesday is when the, that stuff is happening. Then on Wednesday evenings, Passover starts. He was already taken down from the cross. That's what they had to take him down from the cross. Because Passover or yeah, Passover would start. Then he was in the grave, which makes sense, okay? Um, Thursday all day, Friday all day, and Saturday all day. And he resurrected Saturday night, which is for us Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, he was not in the grave anymore. When the women came, he was not in the grave anymore. I thought it was very, very important to understand that. Okay, very important to understand it. So this year, these days fall on exactly those days. The first day of the week, which is on the Sunday, 
is the resurrection day. And really, tonight, Tuesday, is when they have the Last Supper. Wednesday is when he really died. Not Friday, like the Catholics say. I know Americans are not as connected to Catholicism as, for instance, I know I'm from Germany and I'm also Catholic. Oh, I used to be Catholic. Let's put it that way. Sorry I even said that. I was Catholic. No, it was Catholic. So I still have these holidays almost like in my head. Okay, it's very hard to get rid of this false te these false teachings. So again, watch this video. I think he did a, a very good job of explaining that. For me, that was important. I didn't get that right. Okay, even in my last video, I probably didn't get it completely right, but I that's why I wanted to make this video. We're all learning all the time. Okay, all the time we're learning. And so this is good to know because I know I was confused about the three days because he was really in the grave for three days. And how can that be when he dies on a Friday, right? No, it's not the way it is. So anyways, so he made it a lot more clear. So people, now how are we going to remember these feast days of the Lord? And Seth said the same thing. They're feast days of the Lord. They're not they're not feast days of the Jews. They're feast days of the Lord because Jesus fulfilled these feast days. And at least the first four he did fulfill. And the next ones he still will fulfill. And he will fulfill them exactly on the day. And we are looking forward to this next feast day. Why? Because the resurrection day... The Feast of First Fruit is exactly reminding us of that day when we will also be resurrected. And so many people don't make that connection. When Jesus raised as first fruit, we have the same hope. And we're looking forward, not necessarily to our resurrection, but hopefully today our transformation. Because the day is so near that Jesus Christ is returning. So near. Are these days actually, you know, signs? I don't know. I don't know. But it is amazing all the signs that we are having today and that this year could be the day of his return. But let's look at his death. Remember the, the disciple or the first, the first churches, they were house churches. They met on the first day of the week because of that. There's so many people today that are still believing we have to uh, keep the Sabbath. But that's one thing that we don't have to keep. The apostle never said that the Hebrew, I mean the Jew, no, who is it? The uh, Gentiles have to keep the Sabbath. We see that in Acts, where is it? Acts um, either 14 or 15. The apostles give instructions to the Gentiles what they have to keep. And Sabbath was one, not one of them. Now, during that time, during Paul's time, a lot of the, the Gentiles went to the Sabbath because that's all they had. And of course, the Jews went and, and into the um, into the synagogues on Sabbath. They kept Sabbath because it's all they had. Okay? 
But then very slowly after the Christians were really persecuted by the Jews and they couldn't actually go to the, to the synagogues anymore, they started uh, to come together on the first day of the week. We see that also in Acts. That's when they came together. That's when they also had the meal. They had a potluck meal and they celebrated in remembrance Jesus' birth. I mean birth. It's Jesus' death. Sorry. Jesus' death. Okay. And Jesus' new covenant. And I talked about that in my last video, so I'm not going into detail. You know, they took the wine and they took the bread. What kind of bread? Unleavened bread. Okay, unleavened bread. And that's what Porat said as well. Seth said the same thing. You need to have unleavened bread. So what good does it do? It's not going to symbolize Jesus' body if it's not unleavened. Okay. So that's what they did on the first day of the week. Why the first day of the week? Because that's when the resurrection was. This is really... For them to remind them Jesus will return and remind them about this new covenant that they made with the bridegroom. They are now bride and every time they drink the wine, it reminds them of that covenant that they made. And they did that on the first day of the week, not on Sabbath, okay, not on Sabbath, the first day of the week, which is really on a Sunday, it has nothing to do with the heathen sun god. Okay, you, you will find every day of the week is dedicated to a god because the Romans did it that way, because the Catholic Church kept it that way. Okay, every Monday moon god. Okay, C come on. So I don't know what Sabbath, if Sabbath is even dedicated to somebody else. Saturnalia, I don't know. It doesn't matter. What do I celebrate or what do we celebrate? That is the focus of it, okay? Not what somebody else is dedicating these days for. Every day is dedicated to Satan because we're living in this system. It's just the way it is. But that's when the first Christian kept okay, the day as the Sunday because the first day of the week, because that's when Jesus resurrected. And why was the resurrection so important for them? Why? Because he reminded them that they're going to be resurrected as well because Jesus told them and Paul told them. Now, I, when I talk about the resurrection or the rapture, okay, because for us who are left behind, it's not, oh, we're dead and then we're resurrected, but we're going to be transformed. I usually use, of course, 1 Thessalonians 4. But really, when we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus in connection to the resurrection of the dead, or even the rapture, the transformation, I think we need to look at 1 Corinthians 15. Because there Paul tells us exactly how this is connected, the resurrection of Jesus, and why this is so important to know. If Jesus rose, so will we. It had, uh, I think in 1 Corinthians uh, some of the people had problems with the resurrection because some of the Jews had actually problems with the resurrection. They didn't believe in a resurrection. And here, uh, Paul, in the first part, has to convince them there is a resurrection of the dead or else Jesus died in vain. That's what he's saying. Here it says in verse 20, and you can start from the beginning. It says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits. That's why this first, this uh, 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 um, feast is called the feast of first fruit. Okay, why? Because it's symbolic for Jesus' resurrection. That's why. Okay, of course, they thought in those days, oh, first fruit, like uh, the first fruit of the uh, barley. Harvest, because that's what they celebrate around that time. 
they do celebrate first fruit of the barley. They that's when barley uh, harvest is. But they're really talking about Jesus as being the first fruit, the first fruit of the resurrection. But Jesus has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he's telling in the right there, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. He's saying all, all who are in Christ, right? Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed um, all the minions, authority, and power. That's what he does during the wrath of God. Okay? For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay? Because he has to put everything under his feet. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do? Well, I don't want to talk about that. What, what, that are baptized into the death. Because that goes too deep into things that I don't want to address right now. But, 35. It says, this is good too. 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised with what kind of body will they come? The real body? No. How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just as seed, perhaps of weed or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of the seed, he gives his own body. Now, you can read that there's different bodies, okay? Then he goes into 50. It says, I declare to your brothers and sisters that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. Here it is. Okay? In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Now, the last trumpet is not the last trumpet of the trumpets of the wrath of God. Okay? You know there's four trumpets, right? Of the wrath of God in Revelation. He's not talking about the last trumpet of the wrath of God. He's talking about the feast of trumpets because that is when the dead will rise. That is when Jesus will return for his bride. Now keep that in mind because some some people really will teach you the wrong thing. They will say, oh, it's on the last trump of the wrath of God. No, no. He's talking about here very clearly about the Feast of Trumpets. Remember, that is the next feast that Jesus will fulfill. The Feast of Trumpets. How many trumpets will be blown on the Feast of Trumpets? A hundred. And on that last trump, that is when we will be resurrected and transformed. For the perishable must be clothed itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal was immortality, then the, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. You see, this isn't that what we are actually thinking about <coughs> during his resurrection. Why? Because we are looking forward to that day when we are also becoming a part with him first fruits. That's what we're looking forward to. Those are the wise virgins who Jesus will pick up before the wrath of God. Not after. Not after when he is seen in the clouds. This is going to happen when he comes like a thief in the night. See, people want to, they want to deny that he is coming like a thief in the night. He's saying he's coming like a thief in the night. 
But then they're saying, oh, no, everybody's going to see him in the sky. Now, what a, a, a contradiction is that? Is he going to be seen in the sky or is he coming like a thief in the night? Or could there be maybe two events? What is it? What is it, people? Is he coming like a thief in the night or is he coming for everybody to see? There are two events. The first event is like in a thief in the night when he comes for the bride only. And then everybody's going to see it in the sky, not like a thief in the night, at the end of the wrath of God. It's very important to see. Now, those people who will see him at the end, they will not have a glorious, changed, uh, a transformed, immortal body. They will not. I talked about that in my last video when I talked about the thrones in heaven. Who is sitting on the thrones? Of course, the transformed, uh, the, the people that have a transformed body, the bride. Who is standing in front of the throne? The beheaded who don't have a transformed body because they will be collected by the angels when Jesus shows himself in in the um, in the clouds total difference this is happening in secret and some people say oh there is no secret rapture of course there's a secret rapture and some people say oh there's no rapture no what do you think this is what do you think 1 Corinthians 15 is? The resurrection, of course. The resurrection and transformation, of course. And then what happens? Well, they're snatched out. Where are they going? They're going into heaven to the place that Jesus has prepared for them. And why? Because they're going into the wedding chambers. All the things that I've already talked about so many times. The Jewish wedding, the Hebrew wedding. They have to go into the hupa, in the wedding chamber first. This is all glorious. And we don't just celebrate that once a year. We celebrate that all the time. We're always thinking about this. But yeah, it's good to know these days of the Lord because... We need to know that he is going to fill them, fulfill them all and that he has already fulfilled four of them. And that we can look forward to the next one because that next one will be our resurrection, our transformation if we're still alive. And we need to pray, uh, Paul said, how glorious it is to be, uh, um, he said, uh, dressed over. I think he used that word that, that we're dressed over. In other words, we don't have to die. Okay? That we're, we're dressed over and we're changed in a twinkle of an eye. He even longed for that. But of course he died. He's been dead for 2,000 years. Who, know, who knows where he's in, his remains are? They're scattered in the wind. But of course, God has his DNA. And in the last, that last trump, during the Feast of Trumpets, okay? See, a lot of people don't know that either. We have to know these things, these understand these days of the Lord. So we know when the next one comes and how we can figure it out. Because Passover is the beginning of the feast and we know when the next Passover comes and we better be prepared. So yeah, how can we celebrate it? We need to keep these things in mind. But Jesus says, you remember my contract every time you do it, you celebrate it. As often as you can do it. And like I said, the first church, they celebrated it um, on the first day every week. It's not that we have to. We're free. We are free. All we have to do is remember Jesus and what he has done for us. That's all we have to do. And look forward to the day when he is returning. And better make sure we are prepared. 
That's all we have to remember. And remember, we're not of this world. We're looking forward to the world that Jesus is bringing us. Anyways, I'm coming to an end. I wanted to add this. This is information also with the Seth Pora. This is so important, important information. And read all of 1 Corinthians 15 and study it because it's really, really interesting. Anyways, I hope you have a glorious time and you're realizing that we need to be looking forward to Jesus' return, which could be this year.